Hi, welcome back to the channel, it's Clefia. So today we are joined by Dr. Robert Ross Russell. He is the Director of Studies here at Peter House. And what this means is that he is in charge of selecting potential applicants for studying medicine here at the college. Any overseas, he has one of six that are studying here. Perhaps I should just introduce myself very briefly. I'm a paediatrician at Addenbrooke's Hospital. So I'm a clinician within the NHS, but I'm lucky enough to be uh, involved with Peter House. It's been fantastic fun and I enjoy doing the interviews, but they are stressful. Yeah. It's stressful for the students, I think that's fair yeah. to say. We've just done a couple of dummy interviews, and yeah. it's, been, yeah. uh, it's been really interesting. They, it brought back bad memories for, uh, <laughs> for both of them, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Fine, so we have some uh, questions today that some of you guys have sent in. So just to start off, could you talk us through the interview process at Peter House? Yeah. So what happens is we get a whole series of applicants that come through, and we get paperwork on uh, all of those applicants. Um, some of those, most of those, have di uh, applied directly to Peterhouse. In other words, they've said Peterhouse is their college of choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But a number of them can be uh, open applicants. And it makes no difference whatsoever whether you are an open applicant mm -hmm. or a, uh, an applicant who has chosen the college. Um, they're treated exactly the same. And uh, so I get those uh, files sometime before the interviews. And then we're waiting on the BMAT, and we'll talk a bit about BMAT later. Mm -hmm. Um, and we interview most, but not absolutely all of the students. So first of all, we group students. There are two major groupings. One is what we call home students, and one is uh, overseas students. Okay. So applicants uh, from the UK, um, applicants from the Europe, um, are all deemed to be home students, mm -hmm. with the absolutely bizarre exception of the Channel Islands and the Isle of Man, who are strictly overseas students, but um, that's a a really odd thing but broadly European uh, applicants are home students and then students from elsewhere in the world are overseas students okay. and the reason for separating out them quite early on is that the number of overseas places is very very tightly restricted so okay. it would be exceptional for us to get more than one and very often we get no overseas um, students out of our quota of seven in any one year so it's mm -hmm. we average close to one uh, mm -hmm. a year and so the overseas students have a much higher bar they have to get over in yeah. order to get a place here. And it means that if we've got weak overseas students, particularly if they're paying for a flight all the way over for an interview here, mm -hmm. some of them get interviewed locally, but some of them come over for interview here. Mm -hmm. um, it would be unfair for us to bring them all the way over if it was quite clear that they weren't going mm -hmm. to be able to make it. Mm -hmm. And some of the very weakest candidates, if we again, if we feel that there really is no realistic chance of them getting offered a place, then we will we will um, uh, take those off and we okay. will interview the remaining. But the majority of home students will get an interview. So we're wondering if you could talk us through what exactly what happens on the day. On the day, on the day. okay. <laughs> so everyone gets very nervous, yeah. and that includes <laughs> us. Um, so uh, at Peterhouse, we've uh, generally, until very recently, had two interviews, mm -hmm. um, and colleges vary. I yeah. don't think there's anyone who just does one interview. There are some colleges that do three interviews. Mm. Um, there are certainly some colleges who separate out different sorts of interviews. So some okay. have uh, academic interviews or science-based interviews. Uh, some have interviews about how well they think you're ready for medicine in particular, and they vary it. We don't. We've chosen not to. We have some fairly um, hardcore, but we have science-based questioning yeah. uh, interviews, and they are the same. Okay. Um, as each other and we choose to use a lot of doctors to interview so we do have um, uh, one or two scientists present in the interviews but we broadly interview with uh, doctors okay. mm -hmm. so uh, we feel that um, issues about suitability for medicine should generally be picked up by the doctors in their interviewing it is after all what we do all day long when we're, <laughs> we're doing outpatients and all yeah. those things as yeah. you guys know yeah. so um, I think we're okay in that last year for the first time I introduced something slightly different and it was based on some of the American work on open book exams so uh, we're planning to carry on doing this mm. um, we haven't quite worked out all the details, but the idea of an open book exam is that knowledge is so much easier these days. Uh, you simply go onto, onto the internet to get That's hold true. of information in a way that I certainly couldn't uh, when I was uh, training, that we want to try and move some of the interview away from just what you know yeah. to how you interpret. So we give um, applicants a, a brief case study, mm -hmm. um, 
we give them a series of questions um, and I'll talk about how we choose the questions and what we're trying to look for uh, a little later. Um, but we write those questions out for them and they get half an hour with internet access and their phones and a computer and anything they want to, to work through this and to look at issues around these. And then they arrive with that sheet of paper and we ask them some but not all of the questions that are on the sheet. Okay. So I hope that that gets past some of the knowledge-based element yeah. of it into interpretation, opinion, ethics, some mathematics, some computational skills yeah. uh, and others like that. Okay. So those are the three interviews. So what would you say is the best way to prepare for the interviews? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, you need to be clever. I mean, it's, it's staff getting anywhere, you know, going anywhere without that. We expect a high scientific level of knowledge. And so mm. you've got to do well in your exams. Yeah. And you've got to be uh, working hard and expected to get good grades in your A-levels. It will, you know, and so knowledge is not uh, unnecessary in <laughs> any sense. But in okay. many, in many of the candidates, most of the candidates, knowledge is 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 assumed. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have fantastic grades and they are very, very clever. As you are, very, very clever people, <laughs> and that's why you're here in the first place. So that's the first thing that has to be said. Um, preparing for the exam, work experience. Mm -hmm. So we do like people to have shown um, effort and inclination to find out what medicine involves. Okay. Um, I chose medicine for all the wrong reasons. I, my father was a doctor, mm. um, I was clever, I was clever at science and everyone said to me so you're going to be a doctor and I never really looked into it. Mm. I suppose I saw my dad and saw what he was doing but it it wasn't really quite the same and for, and for those people who haven't got medicine in the family and please we want lots of those too mm. um, then it's trying to understand what's involved and that doesn't have to be formal uh, time spent in the hospitals with consultants doing things because there's an advantage there to people who've got mm. the medical contacts or yeah. come from yeah. that background it can be going down to visit you know the little old lady down the road who li lives on her own and has meals on wheels and has the doctors come to visit her once in a while and understanding what health care is it, uh, involved with. It can be doing all sorts of things. Mm. So it, it isn't, there's no structure to what I want experience to be, but I like to see that people have tried to gain some sort of exposure to the things that they'll meet in medicine mm -hmm. and that they've thought about it a bit too. That yeah. They've not been there and done it and you yeah. say, yeah, yeah, I've done that, I, I did uh, two weeks. And? Yeah. yeah. You know, what did you learn? What? Yeah. Mm. So that's, uh, so that's something else that's quite useful. Personal statements um, are always an interesting one for me. <laughs> I, right. I, I understand the role of a personal statement yeah. and, and I, I do talk on a course for sixth formers about personal statements and I never quite know why they invite me back because we have the three of us who give a, a talk. Um, one is a head of sixth form who gives a super talk on what to put in and not. She shows examples, it's yeah. absolutely fantastic. And the third person who talks is um, at one of the medical schools elsewhere in the country and he talks about what the, how they use it, how they score it, mm. how they use it within their assessment. And I sit in the middle and I say, you know what guys, I don't really like the personal statement. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason I don't like the personal statement is, is fairly straightforward. I, I don't, in principle, I don't like the personal statement because my job as director of studies mm. is to make the playing field as level as I can. Mm. Yeah. That means I want people from every background, I want people uh, from every experience, I want the doctor's uh, children to be applying here, but I also want people from every other background. Yeah. And the difficulty with, with personal statements is if you've got a medical family or mm. if you come from a privately educated uh, establishment where they pour over and they rewrite your personal statement for mm. you, you have a different personal statement from someone who sits down and writes it themselves. Yeah. And I want it to be even. I don't want to be looking at that and go, gosh, that's a slick personal statement. This person's going to be good because it could be slick for yeah. all the wrong reasons. So don't get me wrong, we look at the personal statements. I think there's uh, interesting and valuable information. Mm. We may or may not ask questions about the personal statement. We sometimes do and sometimes don't. Um, but I like it to be a reflection of the person yeah. um, and that's what makes the difference for me. Okay. okay, I guess that leads quite nicely into in the interview, what are you looking for? <laughs> so what are we looking for in the interview? Um, 
and I get asked this more times than <laughs> I can, you can imagine. And I, I, I find it fascinating. I really, I, I genuinely find it interesting to know how it is we can choose. There are so many things against us choosing the right people in the nicest possible way. <laughs> <laughs> One is that we're interviewing them at 17. And a 17 year old is so different from a 23 year old. So I'm trying to interpret what this 17 year old is going to be like five, six years time, even in one year's time yeah. is difficult enough. So it's a very, it's a wonderful time to be interviewing them yeah. in some ways, but it's also very difficult to understand what it is that's going to happen over the next few years. Yeah. So I think that's really difficult to do. Um, we've already talked a bit about knowledge mm -hmm. and I really, really don't want interviews to be us being very clever oh, don't you know what's you know what the gene for this is? And yeah. oh, it's on the seventh chromosome in this position. And, and us sort of asking d ridiculous questions that, that we know the answer to, or, or bizarre questions mm. that are... Uh, so I'm, we do try to assess knowledge, but most of that's done through exam results and what's, what's on paper. Okay. So I'm trying to look at how people think. Mm. Um, the example I often use for people, and we don't use this anymore for our interview questions, <laughs> but the example I often use is a question that was used when I started doing interviews some years ago now, that was used by one of my predecessors, Adrian Dixon. And Adrian used to say, um, do you ice skate? And would go, yes or no. Or yeah. Yeah. And he said, oh, okay. So he says, how is it you can ice skate? And the usual response from most people would be, well, we're... We're on a small surface area, mm -hmm. on a smooth surface, there's little friction and therefore we, we can glide because we can move over the smooth surface with, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. And then he says, and this is the killer blow, he says, that's absolutely right, he says, but the trouble is we can't skate on glass. And all of a sudden, a bit like you, they go, <laughs> oh my God, yeah. we can't skate on glass and that's very smooth. And so what's yeah. gone wrong? <laughs> And so we put people into a position where they don't necessarily know the answer, yeah. but they've mm. got the information. Mm. So if they know the answer, not interested, next question, let's move on. Yeah, yeah mm. you're clever, but let's move on to a question that, that explores this better. If you don't know the answer, we start saying, okay, so let's think about what ice is, mm. what is different between ice and water, and it's about hydrogen bonds between the molecules, yeah. and it forms a lattice, and it forms a solid. So if you've got hydrogen bonded molecules of water and you put 70 kilos on a razor blade on top of a hydrogen bomb what happens to the hydrogen bond well it breaks yeah. mm. if you break the hydrogen bond what you've got you've got water if you've got water what do you got you've got a lubricant hence we can skate on on ice so it's not a very complex answer yeah. but it involves processing of information in a stressful situation <laughs> where where you're thinking oh my god i failed i might just go <laughs> home now because i didn't know this and uh, so that's quite you know that is quite a good question it's the rudiments of yeah. the question so we try to ask questions like that. A lot of what we base, or what I try to base our assessment on, mm -hmm. is um, uh, a, the Canadian Medical Society, CanMeds, have produced a series of characteristics of the good doctor. Mm -hmm. So they've looked at this, there's, been, there's, there's, a, there's a fair bit of research about what makes a good doctor. And they have come up with a series of, I think it's seven, but I may have got that slightly wrong, but seven characteristics of a good mm. doctor. It's the good doctor as communicator, the good doctor uh, mm. as manager, the good doctor as, and so forth. And those are the skills that they say that doctors need. Now, we're assessing people much earlier than that, so yeah. some of the managerial type skills that we would expect you to develop are, ain't going to be there. Some of the data processing isn't going to be there because you haven't necessarily got the knowledge base to allow you to move up the pyramid of learning and, and understand how to process that and put it into place. But an ethical framework, yeah. uh, computational skills, uh, um, you know, all of these are important. And so we will try to ask questions. They're not the same for every interview candidate. So there's no point going out and saying to yeah. the next guy, they're going to ask it because we yeah. don't always we uh, do the same questions. But we will ask questions around those areas and so that we get a sense of how you view things, not because we want to know what your views on abortion are, but because we want to know that you can process the discussions and you can understand the outlines of these these areas mm. and are able to converse about them and communicate about them mm. uh, in, you know, in a sensible manner. So what is your take on what to wear for interview? <laughs> we have had quite a range of... <laughs> I uh, can imagine. Uh, <laughs> 
We don't take too much notice. I mean, okay. we certainly don't want suits and well, we don't need suits and ties. You come in a suit and tie, it's mm. fine. Mm. A very smart outfit, it's absolutely fine. Okay. No problem at all. So at that end of the spectrum, I don't think there's any issue. I suppose if you came in jeans with you know cut out knees or whatever else and a t-shirt and that has happened um we say just how seriously you're taking this okay um so i don't we, we certainly don't sit down and say oh my god did you see that orange shirt with those green trousers that's a non-starter he he ain't or she ain't coming here <laughs> we wouldn't dream of doing that of course but uh, it, there may be inevitably some sense of how much people are making effort sounds bad but i think you know what i mean i yeah. think i mean i think the answer is be reasonably smart be respectful yeah. to the fact that you're coming to an interview mm. okay. and um dress reasonably smartly but comfortably yeah. the interviews are december so you okay. know uh, we've had one or two uh, often maybe the girls who come in skimpy outfits who are cold and we do our best to keep the place warm yeah. but you know just have a think about things like the weather to make sure that you're going to be comfortable in there because I have sat in an interview once and I can remember it to this day which was icy cold and I was shivering and I was trying desperately not to show the interviewers I was shivering yeah. and, and it was and I just couldn't concentrate on the questions in the same way. Mm. Okay. So sensible clothes, but yeah. it really doesn't matter too much. Fine. I guess following from that as well is the question of people asking about shaking hands or yes, uh, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, again, no hard rules. Uh, um, I, I think I think looking at your interviewer in the eye is quite helpful. Yeah. Um, because that is so much about what we do in communicating. That's right. And. Um, you know, of course, there's going to be a group of, of, of applicants uh, who may find that difficult to do for whatever reason. Mm. Um, and of course, that's that's absolutely fine. Mm. But I think engaging with your your interviewers, um, it's a difficult balance in some ways. Uh, you know, you don't want them coming in and joking with you and, you know, you're not yeah. on equal f footing. No. Mm. But equally, you don't want anyone who's too deferential. I, it, we, I enjoy enormously those mm. interviews. And we had one a little moment ago on yeah. one of those where the applicant comes back and says, but hold on, what about this? Or how does that work? Uh, okay. You know, getting into a discussion with your yeah. interviewers in a respectful way and, and, you know, is absolutely fine in my books. Mm. And I think it's, it's quite interesting because it suggests engagement. I mean, what we're looking for is interest and engagement. Yeah. Um, I think that's important. And I guess I would also factor in, I think... Um, I mean, we, we, we've talked about interviews, we've talked about shaking hands mm -hmm. and engaging. We might also talk, if I, I take it on, to a bit about extracurricular activities and yeah. other things. And, um, you know, we, we do like that, but it's a huge course. And so there's always a bit of a balance in our minds. But one of the things that I think you can use those extra things, extracurricular stuff that you've done, be it music or art or, yeah. or uh, helping the community or whatever else it is, is to point out to people just how organised you are. Because That's one true. of the things that I think you've reflected on in, in your blogs yeah. is, is about organisation. It's That's about true. is about structuring your day, your mm. week, whatever it is you're doing, to make sure that you fit in the things you do and that everyone has it, everything has its place and That's work true. has to have its place. Absolutely. So, so I think that would be the message. And I think with that, so we had questions about what are common pitfalls that candidates might do at interview? What might, what things they might they do that... Um, uh, so yes, so there's probably a number of uh, of things. Let me think through. One, um, don't try and tell me that you knew it already. If I if you're asked a question and you mm. don't know the answer, and I give you the answer, or somehow the answer comes, oh, I knew that. You know, that is absolute anathema. I can't okay. imagine any of you doing that, but <laughs> we do occasionally get that sort of. Oh yeah, yeah, you know, I really knew that. I, you know, it doesn't matter. We're not here to test what you know. Mm. Okay. Um, but a reflection saying, oh yeah, okay, I see. I went wrong because I was thinking of this, and mm. okay, that's okay. So, so just don't try to pretend you knew stuff you didn't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that really doesn't matter. Um, two, be attentive to whether they're wanting more or they're wanting you to stop. Okay. So. One of the things I'm always aware of in interviews is I've got a limited amount of time. Mm. And so we might have half an hour for an interview, or for some of the interviews, even just 15 minutes. And within that, the more we can get through, the better. Yeah. So I think being sensitive to whether I'm saying carry on mm -hmm. or whether I'm saying 
okay and I'm trying to yeah. get in there you know and, and listen to um, uh, your your interviewer um, use the paper and pens if yeah. you're given them mm. so we leave out paper and pens for people it's not a problem you can write what you like okay. you know we will yeah. shred that afterwards and throw it away but I think use the resources um, that you've got available to you I think honesty and enthusiasm are the key things uh, okay. yeah. and you know dishonesty and boredom uh, are not going <laughs> to work. <laughs> no. Ain't going to work in your no, favour. No. <laughs> so another question we had was about the BMAT. Um, how does PTOS use the BMAT uh, results? So the BMATs are useful. Mm. Uh, to me, they fit into the knowledge-based area. Okay. So uh, to a great extent, uh, two of the papers are multiple choice questions about science and IQ, and they are generally tests of knowledge. Mm -hmm. So it is a helpful guide to us about uh, processing knowledge and, and some degree of problem solving within that. Yeah. So the papers one and two are a guide to knowledge and they are taken into account with the A-levels uh, and, and the uh, GCSEs okay. to, to an extent as to, as to what you know. Really good BMATs are very helpful mm -hmm. and we have to justify our choice of students to the other colleges so there are into college meetings about oh, who right. we want to choose. Okay. So I had to go and say, well, I wanted to take Hubert Carney, but yeah. you know, pff, you know <laughs> I'm not sure about it. And they would say, oh yeah, 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 you can have him or you know, whatever. So, and if we take, um, if I want to take, and I have taken students with poor BMAT results, mm -hmm. it can be quite challenging. I've got to make a very strong case as to why that person is going to thrive in Cambridge, because the worry is that we take people who then cannot cope with the academic element of course and mm -hmm. that of course is a disaster and not so much for college although it's not very good for college it's a disaster for that student mm -hmm. because if they really foul up then actually they can not get a chance to go on to the clinical school and they've lost their opportunity to do it whereas they might have been much better elsewhere yeah so um so we use the BMAT. The essay writing is always interesting because essay writing is not a skill that uh, many uh, first-year students <laughs> arrive with no. in terms of how to write scientific essays. Uh, uh -huh. So uh, we take that with a pinch of salt, but okay. someone who is clearly able to write a good scientific essay um, shines out a little bit uh, because we get some very va variable essay, um, <laughs> essay writing yeah. the first year. Uh, and finally, I think just any general tips that you have for prospective applicants for their interviews? Um, Enjoy it. I mean, yeah. and, and be seen to be enjoying it. It's okay to enjoy it. Yeah. And and many, you don't have to be doing brilliantly well in the interview. And many of the students, and as you know, you come around for supper with us on the, in the first uh, first <laughs> year, and we talk about how you found the interviews. And yeah. many of you say, as you know, I don't think I get in. How on earth did they choose me yeah. or how mm. I did? So everybody trips up in interviews at points. Everybody has good and bad moments. Mm. It's fine. That's what okay. we deal with. Mm. So do try to enjoy it because that will come over. Mm. And, you know, some of our, our favourite interviews have finished with, with students going, is that it? <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah, and they really have seemed yeah. to enjoy it. And that, that enthusiasm, that mm. joy for learning, that pleasure in actually doing the interview um, is fantastic. So that's my tip number one. Thank you very much. Oh, I think that's yeah, all you. the questions I had. And on camera, I'd just like to say congratulations to the two of you because you both got your finals passed <laughs> yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. So these, <laughs> Dr. Moyo, Dr. Stevenson, uh, yeah. here in front of you. So many congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah.